you. How's everybody doing? Good. Thank you for coming out on uh, one of the better weekends we've had as of late. Um, as you know, my name is James Turner. I'm a part of I Got Rehabs. So I'll just go ahead and introduce myself uh, first and foremost. I'm from South Bend, Indiana, born and raised. Um, after I graduated from college, my job at Microsoft actually moved me here to Chicago to start doing advertising. So I was working with Fortune 1000 companies, downtown Chicago and all over the Midwest, helping them reach their customers. One interesting thing is, is that one of my customers was this firm out of Maryville called Digital Target Marketing. And they are the leading real estate investment seminar marketing firm. So my clients were Rich Dad Education and Fortune Builders. So I was building the ads that you sometimes see across the internet inviting you to their free workshop. And I was like, well, shoot, I might as well go. It's free. So I went, and I was like, wow, I could really do this. So I gave them $200 to go to their three-day seminar and to actually get everything going. But lo and behold, this was, I believe, um, in like November. And their three-day seminar wasn't until February. So I had to wait almost three months to even use the knowledge that I just started learning. And that's when I started to really say, OK, how can I do this myself? And I invested money in edu other education things, got a mentor, got a lot of different things to help me out. And that's kind of how I got started in the business. Um, I also run a new community called Flipping Mistakes. One of the things that I've seen in the real estate investment world is everybody talks about how easy it is. Nobody talks about all the things that goes wrong. So that's one of the things that you're going to see throughout this presentation. And if you want to learn more about the things that go wrong specifically, search on Facebook, The Flipping Mistakes with James, Tur with James Turner or Flipping Mistakes Community. And I'll have a video on here later so you can see exactly where it is. And you can actually join. This is a Facebook group where I'm in there a couple times a week just talking about the stuff that's happening. And folks are asking questions. And I promise to respond in 24 hours. This is the only way I answer questions now, because it's too much to be on the phone and texting and emailing and all that stuff. So I only answer questions in here. Um, I'm also a small business and marketing strategist. Because I'm a full-time entrepreneur now, I need extra money. So I help people with soft, small business strategy, videography, marketing, advertising, and a lot of different things. So if you got ideas and other things outside of real estate, you can talk to me as well. One thing throughout the presentation, you're going to see my phone number. That's my cell. Don't call it because you'll mess up the live. Uh, <laughs> and my email address. So it'll be down there so you can take a picture and take note throughout. Cool? All right. All right. So at, from an agenda perspective, the last time I was with Alpha 3, um, we were at my property on May Street. So we're going to give a quick update on what happened with that property. Um, we're also going to go through a case study with this property. And then I also not only like to teach a how did I do this, but I like to give you some tips and different things that just have to do with my story. So we're going to look at my journey into being full time and talk about what I'm going to be doing next in my business. So May Street, it actually sold this week on Wednesday. We had it listed for one hundred and sixty five thousand dollars and it sold for one sixty. So just five thousand dollars below list. This one was tough because if you remember from last time, we had to fire our contractors, we had a whole bunch of delays, and we really didn't think we were going to make that much money. And we had a house right across the street, across the alley, that was boarded up, had tarp all over it, and it was an eyesore. And our first offer on this property came in at 132, um, about two weeks in. And I really got nervous. <laughs> but all in all, we got another offer for 160 and they moved in this week. So we're excited. Yeah. All right, so this house. This house was originally listed for 130000 And this is kind of what it looked like when it was originally listed for 130000 And it was listed at that price about two years ago. Nothing was wrong with the house. Um, the family just had a death in the family, and they inherited the house, and they were li simply looking to sell it. And this is how a lot of the people that we end up working with start out their journey of trying to sell the house. Well, 
In this area two years ago, this was really, really almost the top of the market, but this house wasn't rehab. It was in good condition, but it didn't have a lot of key things. Now, what happened is it sat on the market. They kept doing little minor price reductions, but because they weren't investors, they didn't know what to expect. They never really owned a house. That happened. Over the winter, the pipes burst. And they didn't even realize it at first, but somebody actually came, saw the house, seen the water and all this stuff. And this is literally the kitchen. And right where this row is, is where all this was molded and we had to tear it out. And at that time, they lowered the price to 89,900. So they took a $40,000 price drop just because this happened. Where we ended up getting this house at was actually $60,000. And I want to walk you through how we got them down from that 89 to 60. Because it, one, it wasn't easy, but two, we had to be patient. This was an MLS property, so we didn't do any off-market deals or anything like that, or direct mail or online marketing. We simply saw it when it got changed to 89,000, and we put our offer in at 60,000. We didn't get a response back whatsoever the first 30 days, so we followed up again and said, hey, what's up? And they were like, well, that's too low. So, okay. 30 days later, we hit them up again. Hey, what's up? They said, how about 75,000? We said, the best thing we'll be able to do is the 60,000 we gave you, and we could do your closing costs. Two weeks went by, and they accepted that deal. So it was all about being patient, because at the end of the day, this deal is tight. And I'm gonna walk you through why it's tight. So if you look at, our waterfall chart here, the estimated repairs going in was about $80,000 because it was a lot of damage in the house, not just in the house, but also outside the house. We had a contingency budget because the inspector saw that a lot of the brick was deteriorating and that almost any type of work done to the outside from taking the windows out, from taking the awnings out, could cause something major to happen. So we had to put extra budget to actually a lot for that. Then carry costs and commissions. Before we, we did this project, we were estimating about 10% of the ARV. Um, to be honest with you, now that I've sold and been through a lot of different properties, it's more like 15% of the ARV when you take into account hard money costs and a lot of other things that are in the business. But just with what you see here, it was, not that great of a deal, $26,000, but hey, $26,000, six months, I take it, right? Especially if I got extra stuff going on, how many would take that deal? Right. <laughs> Some of the key partners um, was Structure Rewrite. That's my main GC that I use, and we've had a love-hate relationship because we're growing and expanding, and they're getting used to us, and we're getting used to them but they've been some of the best that I've come across in terms of the quality of work as you see here. Um, Lending Home was our lender. Interestingly enough, there's no reason to write that name down because they don't lend in Illinois anymore um, because of some of the concerns that they've had with how long projects have been taking and the permitting process here in the state, well, in Chicago. Um, Burn Warner, uh, my agent, Torrance Green, he actually got us this house and he'll be listing this house soon. And then um, my attorney, which the attorney is key because the attorney will help you through the transaction, make sure you're protected, make sure all the things goes by smoothly. And I've started to experience some other attorneys and be quite honest, I don't like them because my attorney takes care of me to the point that only thing I gotta do, show up to close and get the check and cut out. So those are the type of relationships you want to foster and build to make sure that people have your back. So now that you understand what it looked like going in, let's talk about what happened in the actual project. So the first step you want to do when you start to get into a project is get your scope of work developed and put together. Right here, you're kind of seeing what my scope of work looked like. If you want a copy of this scope of work, I actually have a Word document in the Flipping Mistakes community. If you go there on Facebook and hit files, you'll actually be able to download this exact Word document so you can do it yourself and make it customized to your house. But 
First and foremost, this is one of the most important documents because it really starts to become the Bible of the flip, especially if you do not get in architectural plans and you're not required to. Your scope of work is everything. Second, it should be a living document. My project manager is my mother. She's right here, Barbara Turner. <laughs> and it's really interesting because as you go through the different things that are coming in the flip and stuff come up and you got to change things, at the end of the day, if the answer ain't, well, check the scope of work, you're going to deviate from the scope of work. And by the time you get to the end of the project, you'd be like, wait, where the thing I said I wanted in here? Well, you ain't looked at the scope of work in six months. You shouldn't expect to have it. So those are some of the things that we're dealing with right now because we didn't make the scope of work a living document. So I highly recommend that. And also be careful using it from property to property. You do want to start with a template just to save time. But what happens is you'll start to do things that you didn't plan on doing. And so in our business, we switched recently and acquired some properties up north, one in the John Hancock building, another in Lincoln Park. Well, some of those materials we want to change. But because we were using some of the same scope of work, we started the project with the wrong materials and got the wrong price from our contractors. <laughs> so those are some of the things you could just want to be careful with when you use it from property to property, which is really popular. But I just wanted to highlight those are some of the things we saw. And then last but not least, I think I just mentioned it um, a little bit ago, is that you can get it on the Flipping Mistakes community. So these are our numbers right now. And this is where flipping gets real. So our original profit, as I said before, was 26.5. So from the time we bought to now, there's been a lot of flips in the area. The market is actually going up, but what's going up in the market is actually four bedrooms, not necessarily three bedrooms. This is a three bedroom. The three bedrooms are going up slightly, but not as much as the four bedrooms. So we have to adjust our expectations on what we're actually going to sell it for. So we got to take 5,000 there. Another thing, we have increased interest and holding costs. And I'm going to get into why in a little bit. I actually got the slides messed up. Um, I think it's coming up next. And then next, increased rehab of $6,000. And I'm going to get into what that was in a little bit as well. But it puts our new profit projection at $10,000. Now, this is not ideal. This does not feel good. But at the end of the day, we're not losing money. We'll actually gain money. And who knows? By the time we get done with this, and it's going to be probably mid-May, and who knows? We might actually sell a little bit more than 180 and have a little blessing there, too, as well. But let's talk about what actually happened in terms of this interest and rehab. Here we go. So the number one challenge we faced, just like we kind of knew was coming, was deteriorating brick. On that front stoop, the second they took that awning off, the bricks came tumbling down. And it, it was rough, y'all, because that, that was the one thing we didn't want to happen. I'm not sure what's happening with that. But we kind of had the budget for it, so it wasn't as big a deal if we didn't have the budget. And we was like, oh, yeah, the rehab's going to be $70,000. And now we, OK, it's up to eighty. Some other things, we actually found significant uh, roof issues once spring came into play. Um, on the back side of the house, as well as on the front, it has a more flat roof, not the typical shingles. And there was some issues where we had almost started drywalling back here, and the water started to come in. So we had to get that patched, get that fixed. And that was something that we couldn't anticipate because we bought this mm -hmm. in the wintertime. So, Buying properties in the wintertime, you got to be careful. Because if there's water issues, you won't know about them because the ground is frozen. So you got to keep that in mind. <clears throat> People's gas. <laughs> this is the reason we have to pay more interest. So people's gas, for some reason, whatso I don't even know why. But because the house was vacant for so long, they cut off the gas, and not just cut off the gas, but they remove where the gas connects to the street. So when I call people's gas, I'm thinking it's cool. Call them. We need the gas on. Let's make it happen. They're like, 
we don't even know that property exists. So you got to call the new construction people. I'm like, well, what do you mean? Like, the, the house is obviously there. Like, what's going on? The meter's there. Like, everything's there. It's just like, you got to call new construction. So it took a week to get in contact with the new construction people. Mind you, it's, it's dead winter. So they didn't came in, did the demo, but they can't start anything else until the house gets some heat, because it's negative two outside. <laughs> so I get in contact with them. They're like, oh, OK, no problem. We can take care of you, but it's going to take about a month. I'm like, what you mean it's going to take a month? It was like, well, first we got to get a permit from the city of Chicago to dig, and that take two weeks. So then we got to get you on the schedule. And we can't even get you on the schedule until we have the permit, and the schedule's backed up two weeks. So we assume once we get the permit, it's going to be backed up two weeks as well. Then we can come out, dig, connect everything, and hopefully everything goes smoothly. It took six weeks to get heat to this house. And all that was nothing but holding costs going out the water and also trying to make sure my contractor felt like he had enough work so he didn't go and do another project. And luckily, fortunately enough, we had other projects to keep them busy, keep them happy, but it just really complicated things because this property, to be honest with you, it should have been done in January. That's what our schedule was. But everything kind of came together to create this perfect storm of, you know, we're now targeting mid-May. Then we also have our private loan. Another thing, doing money with no, doing um, flipping with no money down is possible. It's possible by getting private loans from other people, other investors who don't want to do it themselves. But this project was supposed to take six months. So we got a six month loan. And that was due on the 3rd of April. So at this point, now I got to think, because it's, you know, it's March. I'm like, what, what do I do? Like, one, it's the first time they ever gave me money, so I want to keep my integrity. I need to give them their money back. And not only give them their money back, but I also need to give them their interest, right? But if I do that, I ain't got the money to rehab. So I had to find another investor who wanted to come in. And luckily, the project has some good progress. It looked nice. So it gives them confidence that everything is going to go by smoothly. But I needed to keep my integrity with my original investor. And I need to be transparent with my new investor so they feel comfortable. But that allowed us to get past this challenge of really not having enough money to finish the job in the long run. And then last but not least, I kind of already touched on it in regards to the breakdown. But there's a lot more four bedroom inventory in this area. And a lot of the four bedroom inventory is not just four bedrooms upstairs, per se. It's the one in the basement. And if you looked at the basement here, it's kind of small. Um, so it's kind of hard to put a, ba a bedroom down there. If we're not selling, we're going to put a bedroom down there. But uh, we'll see once it hits the market. <clears throat> so any questions about the house before we get started into my whole journey of leaving corporate America? Who did you buy the house? Who owned it at the time you bought it? Um, it was a family owned the house from their parents. Anybody else? Did Comet charge to dig up the street, or did they just do that? Um, so they didn't have to dig up the street, and it was just a, a note of correction. It was people's gas. Um, you good. They didn't have to dig up the street, so they didn't charge anything for that. They just came, connected it. We just got delayed. So I guess they charged us $2,000. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't know. Right. <laughs> yes. Um, I guess the thing I would do differently, knowing that it was potentially off the grid, when I would start the process and I'm confirmed, hey, I'm about to buy it, I would probably call People's Gas a little earlier just to see, is this going to be a smooth process or not? And if it's not, I would have started all that permitting stuff before, because we didn't have to own the property for them to start that process. No problem. Go ahead, Roy. Um, I got a rehab loan, a purchase rehab loan from Lending Home, and then I got a private loan um, from an investor. So when you say holding fees from the investor, uh, do they charge a certain percent if you can't pay on time, or it's so, more rather you want a higher percentage? It's not more. Uh, it's not. 
So I kind of created the custom terms with the private investor, and it was just a flat fee return. Um, and since at the time of doing this project, I was fairly new, it was very lucrative. It was a flat 20%. That's what they got back. So that ended up being, I think they gave me 20,000. So that ended up being $4,000. Cool. Well, let's jump in. So over the past three or four months, I've had a major shift in my life. And as you can tell, I left corporate America. It wasn't necessarily on my own vision. It wasn't on my own doing. I was one of those people who got an email Monday morning. My boss who lives in Seattle and their bosses, my, my boss's boss who lives in Seattle, sent me an email at 6 AM, said, we need to have a meeting. Please prioritize it. I'm in town. Now, that ain't good. <laughs> ain't no circumstance where that's good. <laughs> So I get in the office, 10 o'clock, my coworker is right next to me, and we, we work remote, we do our own thing because we in sales. And he's like, hey, you get an email from Shelby? He's like, yeah, I got one too. I said, like, all right. So he go down there, he come up, he said, bro, it ain't good, but you know, I don't know what I'm doing, I'm going. So I already knew what, was, what the thing was. And we got there, and she let us know that tomorrow Microsoft was going to be announcing layoffs, and my job was eliminated. They gave me an alternative job, uh, which was really like a step back in my career is what I was doing beforehand. And the biggest thing is the, fi the financial components was the same. They were you know, making right on that end. But this job was a job that wouldn't give me the ability to be um, free and do my own thing from an entrepreneurial perspective. So that was a moment of truth for me. I could either stay tied to the little chain or I could jump out. And I decided to jump out. And one of the things I want to kind of impress upon y'all is what that looked like for me and what I had to continue to keep at the forefront in my mind. Because if I'm in a room with what I think I'm in, there might be a couple of you who are in corporate America or got a full-time job that at one point in time wants to jump out. Is that anybody in the room? Raise hands. All right, bet. So I'm in good company. So when you look at this image, it's a tree. But what do you see? No money. More money? Said no, money. no money. Anybody else? <laughs> Has some fruit, hasn't been trimmed. The interesting thing is um, I'm a believer. And I follow Bishop T.D. Jakes. And he wrote a book called Soar. And in this book called Soar, it's all about giving practical tips that have a faith-based uh, belief system, but it actually helps folks who have little resources be able to dream big and go after the things that they want. And one of the things he talked about in that is really what is an entrepreneur and what can an entrepreneur do? And one of the things he talked about is that at the end of the day, for those who are believers, we know what we want. And a lot of times we talk about what we want, like this table. I want furniture. I want a car. But at the end of the day, God gives us trees. And he asks us to do everything else right here to get the table. So I want to share that with you to really start to challenge how you think when it comes to being an entrepreneur. And for those of you who are of faith, to challenge what you think and what you ask God for. Because at the end of the day, we kind of need to stop asking for tables and chairs and start asking for more trees. Because if we have more trees and we use the things that we got, which is our intellect, our gifts, our talents, and put them together, we can make our own tables. And I got this definition of an entrepreneur up here because I believe I'm an entrepreneur. There's a lot of other entrepreneurs in the room, but I'm called to do more than just be an entrepreneur. And that's all about being a social entrepreneur. It's not just about making money for me. It's also about making an impact. And right in this area here is where, as an entrepreneur, you start to make an impact. And what this means to real estate is this circle right here. Everything on this circle represents who is impacted by a real estate transaction. 
In my business, first and foremost, it's the seller. It's also my acquisition manager, which is Terry right here. If you have any questions about wholesaling, getting deals under contract, you want to talk to my man Terry. My inspector, my lender, my appraiser, my title company, my attorney, all of these people I bring to the table and they get paid when I go buy a deal. On the other side, the seller has an attorney, my general contractor, his subcontractors, my agent. All those people get paid when the deal closed and as we rehab. When we get to sell, you got the buyer's agent, the buyer's inspectors, the buyer's bank, the appraiser, and the buyers finally get a nice house and my private lenders get their interest. In order for me to do well as an entrepreneur, all these people get a check before I get mine. So number one, I gotta buy right. <laughs> because I'm paying all these people. But number two, this helps me stay motivated in the wee hours of the night when I need to make sure this, that, and the other happens. I think about and I look back at this chart to say that if I don't stay up, if I don't do what I'm supposed to do, somebody on this list might not be able to take their kids on vacation, might not be able to put their kids through college. And this is what matters to me more so than the money that's left in my bank account because sometimes it's not as big as I hoped, but when it's not as big as I hoped, I know I can look back in this here and see that I impacted somebody. Then there's cycles. So as we, those of you who um, ascribe to being an entrepreneur, but still are in corporate America, still have a job, you're gonna go through things. And I'm gonna talk you through what that would look like for me. This was my first week at Microsoft. We were in Atlanta in um, the Phillips Arena, and they had brought in 16,000 employees from across the world and a thousand new college hires to go to their national sales meeting. It's a big rah-rah fest where they pretty much rent out all the restaurants in downtown Atlanta, all the hotels, all the entertainment spots, and you as a Microsoft employee just show your badge, you get in for free, get to do whatever you want, eat whatever you want, and it's just a good time. They also kind of tell you about the new products that are coming, and I was blown away. I mean, I walked into here and I was just like, I'm never leaving this place, yo. Then they had all these conferences where they got folks together. This right here, they had us build bikes as a team activity, and we didn't know what they was for. Next thing you know, they bring in um, the Metro Atlanta Boys and Girls Club, and we were building bikes for the little kids. It wasn't a dry eye in the room once that we realized we were actually, you know, we were just trying to beat each other, but that we were actually making an impact. It made you think differently about some of the work you do, but you don't necessarily see the result. But at the end of the day, what it started to do is to put that ball and chain tied around my leg. Right here is a representation of my pay at Microsoft. The, at the bottom, you got salary, then you got bonuses. And year one, I was cool, I was doing good. Year two, got a little raise. Year three, it was cool. And year four is when I started, I got rehabs. Year four, I made a little bit more money at Microsoft, a lot bit more money at Microsoft, and then even had some revenue from my business coming in at the top. But at the end of the day, I was still tied to the chain. After my first year in business, year three, I made a little bit more revenue. And it made me start looking at my job a little bit differently. Because before, when I was at my job, I was excited about 10% raise. I was excited about an extra 5% bonus. But when I got into my business, that little bit of bonus that they was giving me was nothing compared to what I made in my own time on my own power. But even then, I had just started to use my gifts, my resources, but I was still tied to the chain. This year is what that looks like. Everything is really shifted. So for a little bit of this year, I was tied to the chain, but now I'm in a position to where systems are really working. I have my acquisition manager, my mom as the project manager, they're able to make things happen. So now I can be at the top, 
focusing on what the future brings for the business, focusing on making key relationships and partnerships so that the business can thrive and we can get more people in this impact zone so this can continue to rise. So I wanted to share this with you because at the end of the day, yes, your job pays your bills, your job allows you to enjoy the life you have now, but it doesn't mean quit cold turkey. I wasn't planning to quit cold turkey. My best, my goal actually had me leaving Microsoft around June. June is actually, so in two months. In two months is when I planned to leave Microsoft. But obviously there were other things in the works there. But what happened to me allowed me to see if I just put a little bit more faith, put a little bit more works to that thing, it would blow up in a way that I had no dream of ever seeing. So. My business, I started it three years ago. We've done over 38 transactions. Um, that's about eight flips, 30 wholesales. This, in the last 12 months, we're looking at $3.1 million in projected sales as we close out this year. And one of the key things on here that I want to make sure I highlight again is that every transaction I do, there's over 10 people tr impacted by it. And those are the numbers where I want to see grow more so then at 3.1, I want to see this number grow. Because as that number grow, I know my real estate sales and my revenue numbers will grow. So what's next for us? What's next for us, as you saw, there's some mistakes, there's some different things that's coming along. That 3.1 number, that is not profit. That is revenue. <laughs> so <laughs> the goal is to increase our profitability to start thinking more strategically about what houses we stage, to start thinking about more strategically about what our rehab costs are, what properties we pass on, what properties we take. We're also gonna start exploring multifamilies. We're pretty much gonna get out of the large single family game. Y'all welcome to join it and play it, but I'm out. I want quick rehabs in and out in two to three months with little, as little work as possible. Everything else is going to go to the multifamily side of things. And then also looking at another key thing that we've just had some meetings this month and some pretty productive ones. As real estate um, wholesalers and investors, you do a lot of marketing. You talk to a lot of folks that waste your time. Is that correct? No, that's not correct. You got a lot of folks who have problems because they called you. And now you need to find the solution. And that's what we're doing right now. We just expanded to Facebook and we got a lot of leads. We got over 100 leads in Facebook in the last three or four weeks. But about 30 to 40% of them are heavily underwater. Can't work with them. But what that's showing me is that they need to short sell. If they wanna move out their house, they don't need it no more, they're behind, they're about to lose the foreclosure. And a lot of these folks, especially on the south and west sides, they don't even know what that means. So we're actually partnering with a short sale firm that at no cost to them are gonna help walk them through the process to get that short sale done. So one, they don't get a foreclosure on their record, and two, we can get a nice little property in our pipeline. So we're actually selling these leads to this company and we're working with other realtors and different things. So for those folks who want top dollar, oh, I can help you get top dollar. Let me pass you to this agent. And then we might even be able to get something on the backside. So we're looking at these three things at the next phase of how we're doing our business. So we can one, increase our profitability and look at into multifamilies to help supplement some of our cash flow. Because we had eight projects, eight rehab projects going on at one time in the winter time. And I'm gonna tell you right now, seeing 10 to $15,000 a month come out of my account in hard money interest payments, it was rough. So if I had a couple larger multifamily buildings in the portfolio, it could help ease some of that pain. Because although I got the money from the private lenders, I still, it was coming out. And with all the delays we were seeing, I didn't know what was gonna happen. But, and that's another thing that I forgot to touch on. It was actually a blessing in disguise that I got laid off because when I got laid off, um, it allowed me time to really look into the business and see what was going on. Waiting for me in my business um, mailbox was an audit from the IRS that only had a couple days for me to respond. But because I was so busy, 
with work, trying to manage the project, I didn't even look at it. So it's things like that. I was probably about 30 to 60 days from running out of money completely. But because I lost my job, I was able to get ahead of that thing. I was able to see what was going on and raise some more money so that we could be fine and where we're at today. So that's what I want to share with you. This is the Flipping Mistakes group. Um, if you go to Flipping Mistakes with James Turner, the group will be right there, or you could look at and just type in Flipping Mistakes Community. Um, like I said, I'm on here all the time. I do live videos. There's other people in the group now that's doing videos too as well. So um, you can check it out. It's really just a place to learn. And our focus here is questions and how to figure out mistakes. So if you're coming across some mistakes or anything like that, request to join the group. It is private. Can't nobody see what you're doing in here. When you click to join, I have to approve you. So I do that so folks can talk real um, and not have to worry about other folks prying into their business that ain't got nothing to do with real estate. All right?